Welcome to this podcast. Today's guest is Christine Andrews. She's the York Research Chair in Animal Minds and Professor of Philosophy at York University. Welcome on the show. Thanks, Walter. I'm happy to be here with you for your, is this your second or third show? Um, poof, I'll have to sort that out eventually <laughs> because now I'm recording several sessions before the holidays and then I'll be in oh. Australia not recording anything I'll try to trickle that out somehow um yeah good to take a holiday for for Christmas <laughs> and the holiday break good to take yeah. a break <laughs> that's right I'm not planning to record anything in Australia um I don't even have the equipment there anyway but yeah I, I am not planning Uh, even if I did have the equipment, no one wants to record anything over Christmas anyway. <laughs> yeah. The only thing I was considering perhaps was um, a special Christmas episode with Heather, where we both perhaps uh, wear Christmas hats and I don't know. <laughs> That sounds But, lovely. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll do it. But let's get back to you. Now, you were recently involved um, in the founding of a new association PAMBA, the Philosophy of Animal Minds and Behavior Association, in your first meeting in Spain. Perhaps you can tell us a bit more about this. Yeah, we are really excited to have launched this new society. I think it really shows how the philosophical study of animal minds um, and behavior has really taken off. We So the this organization was started originally by me and Colin Allen and Lori Gruen, um, maybe 10 years ago, we conceived mm. this idea. We gave it a, a different name, a terrible name, so I'm not even going to say what it is. Um, and then we never really <laughs> were able to do anything with it. We scheduled some meetings that were canceled mm. at APAs because of snowstorms and then COVID. And so we decided to revamp completely and uh, start again with better luck. And we brought in Susanna Monceau and Richard Moore. And together we... Um, launched the organization at a conference in Madrid last uh, spring. Uh, we ex we put out a call for papers. We expected to have maybe 15 or 20 people submit work. And we had over 70 submissions, which we were blown away with. <laughs> uh, the quality of these uh, papers and abstracts we're reading were excellent. Um, so excellent that we decided that we needed to expand the conference and add a poster session as well. Uh, so it was absolutely wonderful meeting so many young scholars who are interested in the philosophy of mind um, and animals and animal behavior and animal cognition um, and bringing together some of the more familiar voices um, with the newer voices made for a really, really rich uh, experience. So we're enthusiastic to continue. We're going to be um, holding these meetings biannually. Mm -hmm. So the next meeting will be, um, we don't know exactly where yet, but it'll be in um, the spring of uh, 2025, probably in North America. We want yeah. to alternate Maybe in to Canada. accessible. <laughs> Maybe in Canada. We're looking into that. Maybe yeah. in California. We're looking into that too. I think you have the only chair that's officially titled uh, Philosophy for Animal Minds, right? There's nothing <laughs> else like that in the world. That that might be true. Yeah, probably <laughs> is true. Yeah. That's mm. York University who supported it. It's a, yeah. it, it's a competitive chair um, that it was created because York read a bunch of applications from scholars who are looking mm. to... Um, to gain chair positions um, and they selected philosophy of animal minds because I think that they yeah. see also that this is a really rich and growing area. No, yeah. congrats so thanks, uh, thanks to York. that. I think that's a stellar title to have, right? <laughs> <laughs> It's not quite mother of dragons, but I'll take it for <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. So I guess when you were a grad student, philosophy of animal minds really wasn't a thing, right? No, it wasn't a thing. And um, it was confusing to some people what I was doing at the time. So I started grad school in the, the early 90s, 1990s. Um, but I had a lot of support at Minnesota. Um, I really found um, 
a real advocate of what I was doing and my supervisor, Ronald Geary. Um, Ron didn't know a lot about the particular work I was doing. He was a philosopher of physics, um, but he really understood the practice of science and he um, was mentoring me very, very nicely through developing a philosophy of science of animal cognition and behavior. I also had on my um, on my side, Wade Savage, who was a philosopher of mind who told me at one point, you know, this philosophy of animal mind stuff, I think it's really gonna be the future. I think <laughs> it's really gonna go somewhere. Um, and so he's not around to see it, but he he was right, mm. I think. Um, and, and that kind of encouragement meant, meant a lot to me. Um, yeah, Minnesota supported me really nicely and also gave me funding to continue my research, my empirical research as well. So I spent mm. almost a year at the Institute for Child Development at Minnesota under the supervision of Peter Verbeek. And we ran um, a study in false belief study with children, looking at the differences between children's ability to predict and explain behavior when the character had a false belief. Um, wow, so I very impressive yeah. uh, for that time. I don't think a lot of philosophers were involved in experimental research back then. <laughs> no, no. Again, that's why other people often looked at me oddly, like hmm. whether I was a real philosopher. And when I went on the job market in 2000, 1999, I went on the job market, um, finished my dissertation in 2000. Uh, Ron Geary suggested to me that I kind of fix this, fix people's understanding of me and what I'm doing in philosophy yeah. <laughs> by using the halo effect and saying, oh, I do philosophy the way Dan Dennett and Stephen Stitch mm. do philosophy. And so I used that line in all my interviews. And I think I got offered every job I um, wow. had a camp, had a, a APA interview for, except for, except for one. We didn't, we didn't click, but yeah, we, I think the line worked really well <laughs> because my first question was for all of these job interviews, the first question was, mm. why is what you're doing philosophy? Um, and so I had to explain and then they liked it. They liked yeah, the well, it's fitting to have you on then very uh, shortly after Dennett's interview, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, I guess in a way I'm benefiting here from was like this lineage of people breaking ground in philosophy to do this empirical research where during my PhD, I spent a good chunk of my time um, in Nikki Clayton's comparative cognition lab in Cambridge, as well as Roberto Salguero Gomez's um, life history lab in Oxford. And perhaps a decade ago, people would have been, uh, philosophers would have objected, what's the point of that? <laughs> How is that benefiting your philosophical career in any way? But yeah, yeah in a way, I can yeah. be thankful that this ice has been broken. <laughs> well, it was fun ice to break. That's that's for sure. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what was your PhD dissertation on? It was on theory of mind. Um, so it was called something like predict predicting mind mm -hmm. toward a new folk psychology. Um, and it is what evolved over 12 years into my first book um, um, called Do Apes Read Mind Toward a New Folk Psychology. So it, it took me longer to turn my dissertation into a book than it took you to turn your dissertation <laughs> into a book. But, but I, I do slow philosophy, I think. <laughs> My book is probably also less changed from the original dissertation. <laughs> yeah, my book is very much changed from the original, uh, the original dissertation. I was I was approaching the question of theory of mind, which in the '90s, as as some of you might know, um, was quite a hot topic. Um, it was assumed that humans understand one another by attributing propositional attitudes and predicting behavior based on what they think others believed and desired. Um, and having worked both with children and prior to that, having spent a year at a dolphin lab mm. working with bottlenose dolphins um, in Honolulu, I was really skeptical that um, the attribution of propositional attitudes was a really 
core fundamental way that children and, and other animals were, were thinking about one another. But I was really convinced that they were thinking about one another's minds. So there was a bit of an assumption that was underlying the theory, theory, simulation theory debate of the time hmm. um, that I was challenging. And that assumption was that we're constantly attributing beliefs to one another whether we then manipulate them through theory or simulation mm. was the big debate, but it was that shared assumption in the debate that I um, I thought was problematic. And so the dissertation was a critique of that assumption. I had a really hard time getting published though. Um, I got mm. a lot of rejections saying along the lines, something along the lines of like, you're not playing the game. You're not working within the mm. current discussion. Um, and I, was finding it really difficult to figure out how to um, how to make the points I was trying to make in a way that would be consumable by the parties in the debate. And I don't think I actually ever succeeded in doing that. Hmm. I don't feel like the uptake that I ever got the uptake I was looking for. Um, I did get to publish some of this work in a book that was co-edited by Quentin Smith, who has, was my my mentor as an undergraduate and during my master's degree at um, Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo. Quentin was a, a very interesting fellow, um, but he really did give me a shot when he invited me to write this chapter for his book because no one else wanted to publish it. Yeah. People were much more interested in publishing the work that I was writing, critiquing um, Davidson's uh, mm. theories, or critiquing Dennett, but this this novel contribution I was trying to make, I was I was having a hard time to place. Yeah. Mm, I can see how that would be hard. So you tried mostly to publish in philosophy journals. Yes. Right. Yeah. I want. Uh, did what was the first publication you had in a science journal? Oh, the first publication I had in a science journal wasn't until um, Anne Russin and I published on orangutan pantomime, mm. and that was that was like. 10, 15 years later. Um, yeah. How did that come about? Well, that was um, a really fun project because I was, by that time I was in my second job, I was at York University and I knew that Anne Russin was an orangutan researcher who was also at York University, but we hadn't had a chance to meet when I interviewed for the position. And so I, she was having a talk that fall after I started the job and I went to the talk and afterwards I went up to her and introduced myself and told her I'd been working with bottlenose dolphins. And she said, oh, bottlenose dolphins are not interesting at all compared to orangutans. You need to come to Borneo and see the orangutans. And I said, well, sure, I'll come <laughs> to Borneo and see the orangutans. I'm not sure about the dolphins being less interesting, but I'm open to orangutans. Uh, and so that was in 2006 that I traveled to to East Kalimantan, um, Indonesia, for the first time um, with Anne to her research site at Samboja Lestari, where she was studying rehabilitant orangutans. So these are the uh, little orangutans who were mm. separated from their mothers and had to be cared for by humans with the goal of them being released at, at some point, but it's a really fraught situation in, in so many ways. It was really tragic, but I learned so much about orangutans. I learned all these things that I had been um, reading don't exist. I saw them when I was in the field. Mm. With them. I couldn't believe it. Uh, it was just all uh, shared attention and deception and social referencing and it was just that's how the orangutans were interacting with one another and with us as they were trying to manipulate us and steal our pens and mm. wanting to um explore this strange enormous white woman who entered the forest with them <laughs> <laughs> it's i guess hard to not to come to agree with the apologists' arguments against the behaviorists that they sort of artificially constrain what animals are capable of doing and describe them in very narrow ways just by exposing them to so few stimuli that, of course, their behavior is not going to be as complex, right? Yeah, there's, there's that. Um, but there's also the kinds of social interaction that you mm. can witness and also participate in 
in different sorts of settings, I think. So the the rehabilitant setting was a very unique one mm. because you're not supposed to spend so much attention with the orangutans that they get habituated to strange humans, um, but you have to socialize with them because you're trying to raise um, mentally and socially mm. healthy individuals. Um, and so we did have relationships uh, with, with the animals. It, in a, in a similar way, I had relationships with the dolphins at Lou mm. Herman's lab. Um, and it was developing those relationships that, that made it just absolutely impossible for me to even conceive that these other species were not trying to communicate with mm. me, we're not sharing emotions, we're not interested in um, some of the same things that I was interested in. Uh, yeah, it was, it would have been like, thinking that that of a an infant um who i was interacting with as well it was just it was very clear and when you treat an animal as if they're a communicative partner and you're trying to share information and experiences then um that scaffolds the ability to communicate and to share mm. experiences no, that's fascinating now for your own students i think you also tried to give them opportunities to become involved in this kind of animal research yeah, this is one of the things that's really important to me um, and is part of the PAMBA society is that we want to be able to fund and support students to get experience doing research, scientific research, or to have experiences outside of a classroom, outside of a library, outside mm. of an office, um, and engage with, with other species. So there's a kind of knowledge that you gain that's not discursively learnable. Um, and so I've, uh, one of my first students, Ren Tinklenberg, um, I funded him to go to um, the Leipzig Zoo and mm. work with the uh, folks at Max Planck to do some studies with chimpanzees um, and the other great apes there. Um, before that, I was involved in supporting Maria Botero, who was um, a graduate student who started at York the year after I got my job. So she was working with Stuart Shanker, and he had arranged for her to go to Gombe um, to, to work with the chimpanzees and, and do a study on mother-infant interaction mm. uh, for several months. And so I saw how much that changed her um, and her thinking. And I knew yeah. that I had to give that experience to my students as well. well it's so, fascinating. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. um, sometimes I've watched some YouTube documentaries and the like uh, recordings of people going into nature to do this kind of research. But of course, that's quite a, a change in lifestyle, of course, where um, you, you're not exposed to any of the Western <laughs> luxury items you might expect uh, warm hot showers maybe um yeah perhaps you yeah. can give some anecdotes from your experience yeah it's um it's true well the first time i went to borneo i was expecting um a kind of a rough living but samboja lestari was quite luxurious mm. um we didn't have hot water but we had very nice buildings and you know like nice beds on <laughs> nice wooden platforms yeah. and things like that um so i was quite surprised uh, i just had to get used to cold mandies instead of hot mm. showers um but when we went when i was in kutai national park with Anne, when she switched over to um, working with wild orangutans um this was uh, i visited there in 2015 um, along with my partner brian huss and our daughter alexandra who was seven years old at the time. And I guess maybe I was thinking it would be a bit more like Samboja Lestari, but it, it was not. <laughs> we had to, um, it was quite a long drive, set of drives to get to where we got in the boat. And then we had a long boat ride and then we had to hike in to the forest um, from the boat carrying our supplies. And there was a traditional built longhouse and a kitchen and then a Mandy building. And we didn't have electricity except for a few hours at night when we ran a, a gas mm. generator. We we didn't have internet um, except at around 7 a.m. when the satellites were just right, everyone's <laughs> phone would explode and we'd get all the messages um, that had been coming in while we were asleep. Um, 
I was there on my birthday, actually, and mm-hmm. you know, I woke up at 7 a.m. and had all of these messages from around the world wishing me happy birthday. Um, and then I was not in touch with anybody for the rest of the day because <laughs> uh, we just didn't have Internet. But one of the things I found really funny was that the in the evenings when the electricity came on, we had a TV and we got some uh, reception and had some DVDs to watch. And the most popular show, um, you might find find it surprising, but all the field assistants wanted to watch nature documentaries. Really? They spent all day following orangutans <laughs> in the forest. And then to relax, they watched other people following other species. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have need uh, the right commitment, I guess, for that kind of work. We have to spend months in nature, right? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And some some of the field assistants and the lab manager, Provo Concoro, has I've been living there for years, right? Oh. And they just they'll leave and, and take breaks, but they're mostly living in the forest. Mm. Yeah. It is a real amazing commitment. It's it's slow science too, right? You're not That's getting right. publications every week from this because <laughs> You're waking up at the crack of dawn. You're mm. going to look for orangutans. You might not even find an orangutan. And if you do all day long, they might just be eating in a tree. Mm. Um, one day I was following consorting, a pair of consorting orangutans. This was extremely exciting. I mean, because there was a female, there was a male. The male was long calling the, over here. The female was kind of approaching. She wasn't quite sure. Um It was a very, very slow consortship. It lasted for multiple days and it never, it never went anywhere. The female finally just left. Um, And uh, one of the (laughs) the assistants who I was traveling with said, oh yeah, she doesn't like him. He's too lazy. He's just eating food and long calling every once in a while and doesn't move enough. So (laughs) So it's not always very exciting. Yeah, that I guess was it's hard exciting. to write a paper about that, no? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. So the so I did get to write a paper about the pantomime communication back um, from the experience with the rehabs, because it was the rehabs who really wanted to communicate with us. Hmm. Um, and us being uh, humans who don't really understand the frame of reference of a, an orangutan didn't get the basic messages yeah. and so the the um orangutans had to often act out what they wanted and and be more mm. deliberate to communicate what they wanted and so we would we would observe them acting out behaviors that they wanted us to perform on them and that mm. led to that, the, that first paper yeah do you think zeus can be a good replacement for that kind of research where you perhaps don't have to travel too far Yeah, I think it's a good question. Um, I think that there's a certain, a certain thing you lose with zoos and zoos um, from a wild situation, that's for sure. Um, Especially when it comes to social structures, um, cultural development, not to say that there isn't social learning in zoos, but I think that there's less of a, a real need to learn a lot of the skills mm. that uh, a juvenile would need to learn to survive in the in the wild. A lot of the right. skills, and that's that... the worry with trying to rewild the orangutans, for instance, from zoos, right? It absolutely is. Um, it's also a problem with these de-extinction programs. I think that they're mm. going to bring back a woolly mammoth because you're going to bring back an animal with the DNA of a woolly mammoth, but you're not going to bring back a woolly mammoth with its cultural behaviors, yeah. social structures, norms, or any of that. That's gone. Hmm. might just be like elephants that have been taken from the mothers and they just become very aggressive <laughs> and very hard yeah. to keep right absolutely hmm. yeah we've seen this in in um, south africa when elephant with the elephant calling and the hmm. young males are acting terribly because yeah. they don't have the same kind of social structures that restrain their behavior taught them the appropriate hmm. ways to an elephant And perhaps it shouldn't be surprising because after all in humans, when children lose their parents, they often can develop things like aggression, mental disorders and the like, right? It doesn't seem that different. It doesn't seem that different. And you might think that we we should have expected this. Um, But I think that sometimes it's easy 
for us to forget that we're all humans are another species of animals and mm. we can learn things and, and form some expectations about what's going to happen in animal societies from the things we see happen in, in human societies. It's why I'm so interested in animal culture and mm. animal norms these days and, and really excited about sharing information about animals as normative cultural beings who have certain ways of being, ways of doing mm. things around here that is important for them to share with immigrants who are moving into their community, their offspring as they grow up. Um, yeah. Yeah, it seems... Um... Like most people will probably, if they asked what distinguishes humans from animals, they might say something like culture. That is, that in humans, for instance, perhaps look, our evolution has been much more driven by culture in, in the last uh, thousands of years. But for the animals, uh, no, you can just take them from uh, from their parents and they'll develop normally. But I guess that's just a, a misconception, right? Yeah, it's a misconception. It's a it's a question of degree, um, but it's not a lack. And mm. it's just, if anything, the latest in a long line of, of purported properties that are thought to distinguish humans from other animals, right? So humans as the rational animals, as Aristotle had it, we have a lots of reason to think that we're not the only rational animal. Mm. There are lots of ways of conceiving of rationality, including logical reasoning and statistical reasoning that we see in other species. Tool use was another thing that was thought to distinguish humans from other species. Of course, we see not just tool use in other other animals, but we see tool construction and the construction mm. of tools to make other tools. Um, so this is another thing I'm really interested in because the the kind of cumulative culture that you can get through um, the animal technologies, including things like constructing nests, which is something that we see not just in birds, but we see in, in primates as well. Um, I'm really interested in this question about co-evolution in humans mm. and other species and how much we might have learned from say the weaver birds and the nests that they built um did it inspire early hominids in their creation of um cordage and weaving um baskets that mm. they used to carry items which was a real technological innovation right, yeah. in our history to be able to carry things around it's, it's amazing <laughs> Yeah, I guess the history of technology has often taken a lot of inspiration from other animals, right? Mm -hmm. um, flight, of course. Humans mm -hmm. have tried to imitate birds for a long time. And now, finally, we can. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. yeah. Do you have uh, any good examples for where within the same species you get striking cultural differences in different groups? Um, I mean, it depends on what you mean by striking. The kind of examples that we see of um, of cultural differences, mm -hmm. most of these are really have been studied in primates and in, in chimpanzees. Uh, I think most of the differences have been uncovered. So this is research by basically all of the folks who are doing wild chimpanzee research have come together and they're collecting um, these behavioral traditions that they're seeing that varies from place to place. But one of the, the things that one of the um, behaviors I find interesting is this leaf clipping behavior, hmm. which involves tearing leaves. Um, because in, in one in some communities, it's a sexual solicitation. And in another community, it is not a sexual solicitation. Oh. <laughs> and, and so that seems like a place where uh, an immigrant might get confused. Um, but there it apparently they learn this because these behaviors are stable. Um, the meanings of these behaviors are stable over time. And yet there's immigration in, um, mm. in the species. And so for these patterns to stabilize, the immigrants have to learn uh, the right. new meaning of this, of this behavior. Mm. Have you ever observed um, conflict uh, where new immigrants into a group just failed to understand these rules? Yeah, so this is an ongoing research program. Um, we don't have great examples of this at this point. It's a question that hasn't really been um, given sustained focus. 
the work that's out there on how immigrants are received um, are, um, I mean, there's some nice work that Lydia Lunx has done where she looks at how immigrants, chimpanzees will sometimes give up um, a more productive way of cracking nuts for a less mm. productive way of cracking nuts in a way that that um, copies what's happening in the new community yeah but what we what, what we don't know and i've talked to her about this she's like we just don't have enough cases to know whether or not the copying of the new behavior helps the immigrant um or and no one's ever witnessed anything they've interpreted as um anyone in the group getting mad if an immigrant cracks nuts in the wrong way mm. um, in fact some primatologists have told me they're quite skeptical that anybody would care how an immigrant cracks nuts yet there's a study um and in behavior um a weird behavior in a, a swedish zoo um of this female specific behavior called the cross-armed walk where the females in this community walk around on on three limbs instead of four and they just hold their arm. Mm -hmm. um, it's awkward. They can't carry things very well. They can't move as quickly. Uh, and in a study of this behavior uh, and how it was adopted when two new females entered the group, one of the females conformed to the behavior and the other did not. And then years later, uh, when they did a social embeddedness analysis, they found that the, the individual who conformed to the behavior was more deeply embedded into the community mm -hmm. than the individual who didn't. Now, of course, we don't know about any kind of causal connections. Um, these are all really suggestive and interesting places to look. Uh, and my my colleagues, Evan Westra and Simon Fitzpatrick and uh, a host of uh, primatologists as well are finalizing, putting the funny, fi finishing touches on papers that we hope will be out. In, 2024 um on how we can study the, mm. the sort of question yeah, those, papers, more those papers sound very uh interesting because at least at the moment i'm writing this book with heather browning on what are zoos for and one of the goals people at least ascribe to goals is research right and what types of research we can do in zoos is actually yeah perhaps not really recognized there's much more we could do in principle but it, maybe it's hard to get the kind of funding going in order to support that research even though it seems like it would be much cheaper than say for a university or some scientific lab to acquire some animals they would they wouldn't be able to provide nearly the same housing uh, but here obviously often you get members of one species so if it's great apes transferred to another group whether that's for breathing purposes or something or maybe just because that member just doesn't fit in that group and rather than have them stay in their own separate enclosure all alone maybe it's better to try to get them somewhere else maybe they can integrate there there perhaps you could um try to investigate the, the ad adoption of uh, unique cultural norms right Absolutely. I think that zoos would be a really good place to study uh, social norms um, in non-human animals. And I think that studying culture in, mm. um, <clears throat> in these zoo communities would also be really important. A lot of the work on culture, like I said, most of the work on culture is done in, with wild populations. Mm -hmm. But by culture, we just really mean, the researchers just really mean social transmission yeah. of behaviors that sometimes distinguish one group from another. So of course you see that in, mm. uh, in captivity as well. And you might see really stark differences from how you know one species acts in the Toronto Zoo versus how they act in the Leipzig mm. Zoo because of the way the materials they have to work with, the individuals that they're mm. engaged with how all the husbandry practices go. And I would really like to see that the cultures of captive animals are also recognized. Mm. And even more importantly, that the cultures um, across species of humans and captive animals together are recognized. And then finally, that the cultures of wild animals and the humans who live around them are also recognized. Mm. I think that we could do better welfare 
if we recognize that and we could also do better conservation uh if we recognize that we might have in fact mm. shared social norms i suppose sometimes it's just assumed that any behavior that deviates in in a zoo from behavior in the wild that that's just indicative of something pathological something bad but it could just be this unique new cultural diversity which is actually maybe something we should cherish right yeah, and we've written, a, Simon Fitzpatrick and I have written about that in particular. We we gave the example of, of eating feces, which is something that mm. zoo animals will sometimes do. And it's often discouraged because it is obviously, you're risking getting sick with pathogens right. if you're eating yeah. your own feces. But the risks aren't that immense. Um, mm. And it also may be that this behavior is an important cultural behavior for the community. And human communities also <clears throat> engage in behaviors that are sometimes risky to our health mm. right we pierce our pierce our body and we tattoo our body and we do we smoke cigarettes we do things that are mm. risky some of which we try to stop but others of which we just accept as as um as part of a, an important cultural behavior so mm. if eating feces is important for a community of chimpanzees if it's a way that they are bonding as a community and a yeah. way that they can signal their um, their group membership, then maybe it's something that we should tolerate, even though we, as the caregivers, might find it really disgusting mm. and, and, and worrisome for their health. Yeah. Do you have uh, an estimate of the kind of time budgets of, say, orangutans in the wild versus in zoos on how much time they spend on uh, social exchanges? Mm, I don't have that information, mm. but certainly in the wild, most of the um, social interaction with orangutans would be mother infants. Mm -hmm. um, and the males tend to travel on their own. Uh, adult males tend to travel on their own. And there's there are reports of juveniles traveling together. Um, mm. But this is why orangutans are called semi-solitary species, because they're not living in large gregarious groups the way chimpanzees are. In in zoos, so the Toronto Zoo has some orangutans, and they have to be carefully managed how they're put on display, who's put on mm. at the same time. Um, but uh, when they're off display, um, they are all in the same room. Um, they can all see each other. So certainly there's going to be a different way of being social in a zoo um, where you don't have the same kind of space than the way orangutans are social in the wild. I also think it's really important to recognize that just because you're not in visual proximity doesn't mm. mean that you're you're not um, being social with another species. There are other sensory modalities that the orangutans might be using. They might smell, like the field assistants can definitely smell the orangutans and they know an orangutan has been in this mm. location and how old, how long ago, um, how many days is it old or a new smell so presumably the orangutans are smelling one another they're seeing where one another has eaten they're seeing the remains of the the fruits mm. on the ground and the gingers that have been pulled up so there might be a lot more understanding and social engagement that just doesn't look like the kind of social engagement um that happens when you're face to face yeah um, yeah. yeah i wonder if uh, we get a kind of artificial selection going on in zoo populations where almost these populations are driven to be more social because they just have to live in very close proximities and then individuals that might be say antisocial and i don't know a co be in conflict with other individuals they might not have a place to hide they might get into fights and then animals might die that happens sometimes in zoos yeah. right and then that's right yeah yeah there are there are these these really sad and difficult cases like with happy the elephant in the bronx zoo hmm. um and i think it's really hard to know what to do what the right thing to do is for for happy in this particular case yeah, um, yeah. so i guess this also happens in the wild it's just not as visual that individuals are injured right yeah, but and, and then there's also more space, right? So if yeah. you really want to get away from other individuals, generally you can do that. That's right. Hmm. So where are your research plans for the next uh, decade going? Do you have anything <laughs> particular in mind? 
Yeah, well, so I'm I'm really interested in taking this work that we've been doing on social norms and translating it to the public. So mm. I've got I've got a trade book that I'm uh, that I've been working on, and I'm really turning to that in January once I've got got these last bits of work done on the on these papers. Um, I'm also really interested in then writing a, a philosophical monograph on mm. the evolution of sociality. Um, the history, I think, of cognitive science has been really individualistically focused. Um, so we're very interested in what an individual can do on their own um, and what rationality is in an individual mm. and so on. Um, and I'm I'm interested in kind of flipping that model and thinking about what um, cognition looks like if you start by thinking about it as evolving in groups. Um, so is yeah. that somewhat similar then to Kim Sterelny's evolved apprentice approach, where at least we think, oh, well, at least when it comes to humans, perhaps uh, we evolve in this kind of trainee relationship where there's a lot of learning going on by imitation and you can't do that all by yourself, right? That you're part of a group. Well, it's it's different from that because I'm I'm looking um not in the hominid lineage yeah. only. I am looking in the other lineages, the other animal lineages. I'm very interested in um kind of the deep history of sociality mm. in the earliest organisms. So I've been doing a lot of reading on um on uh, on C. elegans mm, on really? um. Yeah. So really a natural history of sociality. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So I'm really, I'm really excited about this project. I'm just at the earliest stages. Um, but I am looking at also trying to figure out what we can learn about sociality from the fossil record. Mm. Um, what are the limitations <laughs> of what we can learn from uh from the traces we have of our our ancient um the ancient animals that lived uh, that we have all evolved mm. from and that, who are very, very different from us. And yet um, maybe they were living in, in groups and needed to mm. work together to begin with. It might've been that individual cognition was the real um, achievement. Uh, and it was social cognition that was the original cognition. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose it's a similar problem that I, Peter Godfrey Smith, Ivia Blanca, Simona Ginsberg, and many others face that try to look at origins of consciousness in very early evolution. We have this very trace uh, mm -hmm. fossil record approach, and it's really hard to make inferences, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're based on the scarce evidence, we try to make the best sense of the past. And maybe there has been too much of an assumption that, well, this sort of sociality, that's a human invention more or less. So of course, that all just be selfish and operate by themselves. And mm -hmm. that doesn't have to be right. Hmm. Yeah. So I don't know that we're going to find fossil evidence of either individual yeah. evolution or social evolution. But I am really curious on what the story would look like if we start it with a different assumption. Hmm. Um, yeah, I wonder if in arthropods, at least, this might have evolved very soon, right? With the evolutionary yeah. history of, uh, say, ants, presumably, it's really old and very successful, right? Yeah. Hmm. The eusocial insects have a very interesting social structure that, yeah. yeah. It gives us different models and different ways of looking at sociality and different ways of thinking mm. that sociality could have been something that um, that evolved really early on as a solution to uh, to the problems of life of of continuing existence. Mm. Yeah, I had this uh, course in Sydney with Marine O'Malley, who's a philosopher of microbiology. And if you look at the philosophy of biology literature, there has been, a uh, major focus on uh, mostly mammals, actually, or birds, maybe perhaps humans really have gotten a lot of attention 
But there's a lot of focus on the attractive animals, plants also, there's very little attention given to them. Mm -hmm. But of course, most of life is mm -hmm. um, is single-celled life. Mm -hmm. uh, my, it's a microbiological world we live in, and even if we can't see it. Um, mm -hmm. And a point she makes is that we have this mistaken understanding of the microbiological world by applying this lens from the macrobiological world to it when there isn't really something like individuals. Well, there is competition, of course, but very few cells operate without the context of others. So if you try to take cells from nature and just cultivate them in a lab, almost all of them die because they depend on the complex presence of many others. They produce some molecule uh, as... Is so it just a byproduct of the cellular activity and that is then used by some other organisms and you get this kind of complex network that's mm -hmm. perhaps hard to describe that as social in the sense of all oh, that mm -hmm. they have these intentions to cooperate with each mm -hmm. other um but they are but they are social in the sense of perhaps in in a, in a purely game theoretic sense right mm -hmm. that it's it's evolutionary beneficial to not produce some pro uh, chemical product yourself but depend on that from some others um and yeah that yeah. seems almost like a i don't know kind of uh like a kind of market of uh, single cells mm -hmm. almost of cooperation right yeah i mean and so the question is then when did we get cognition when did mm. we get behavioral flexibility yeah um, because if it's if there's no flexibility, then all right, we just have this large mm. interacting network. But once we get behavioral flexibility, mm. cognition, and the sort of um, differences in behavior given the same kind of inputs, then we already have the kind of pressures that led to right theories of social intelligence um, mm. in in mammals. Yeah. Um, but a long time ago and in a much smaller, smaller world, a uh, much smaller space. Uh, so I, yeah, I think it's, it's really promising if we look at these models of, um, of organisms and the evolution of cognition and the evolution of sociality, um, we might actually find that it's easier to answer some of our questions because we don't have all of the details and convoluted you know, evolved capacities that we see in animals like us. Um, this kind of studying simplicity argument, I think, also works for, for investigating consciousness. If you think that consciousness is something that might have evolved early on in evolutionary history, mm. which I do, then focusing on neuroscientific investigations of humans and macaque monkeys is strikes me as a little strange um, because you're only going to find a very different and highly evolved and, and probably convoluted example mm. of consciousness. And if we study simpler exemplars, study the C. elegans um, for consciousness, we might make a lot more progress on developing a theory, which is even though we've made had a lot of progress in the, yeah. the science of consciousness, we haven't made a lot of progress in, in developing a theory of consciousness or understanding what consciousness is. Hmm. Uh, so I have a paper on that coming out in mind oh, and language. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure where I'm going next. Uh, I'm writing this book with Heather at the moment, and I um, have another book under contract on how evolution can be modeled using different resources. But one resource we can use is, of course, these microbiological contexts where we can have populations and we can observe evolution taking place, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And yeah, it would be interesting to think about under which conditions you can get some, at least the population becoming some more social, right? Mm -hmm. um, you could measure that and you can mm -hmm. um, determine which ecological conditions perhaps are relevant for the evolution of those traits. And then perhaps you could see something like a richer cognitive capacities evolving. Yeah. But that would mm -hmm. probably take longer. But mm -hmm. that's certainly one interesting way, perhaps, yeah. to investigate that question. Mm 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's just the the next kind of step in the study of of animal cognition um, and in the philosophy of animal minds mm -hmm. as well. Right. When I got into this field, it was people were just talking mostly about chimpanzees, right? Yeah. And <laughs> maybe some things about dolphins, but it was a really narrow focus. Um, and the focus of, of species have just continued to to increase. Um, and each time it increases, there are big debates. There are big debates about fish um, pain and sentience, then big debates about uh, octopuses and crabs and, and now big debates about insects and plants. Um, but these debates seem to kind of settle down with a kind of acceptance, a growing acceptance that these other species are cognitive creatures mm. with um, conscious experience and proper subjects for investigation. Um, so I think that the next, the microbiome is our next, uh, our next step in this path. <laughs> yeah. So where do you see the field of animal, the philosophy of animal minds going in the next, well, I mean, decade is of course one question, but perhaps in 50 years from now, that's much farther. Do you think, where do you think the field is going there? Yeah, well, I would love to see the kinds of examples that have been classically used in, in philosophy to just regularly include thinking about other species and not just mm, human species. Yeah. Um, when we have, you know, our deep questions about, um, you know, free will, the good, um, how to know things, these are all questions I think that can be informed by looking not just at our, you know, one's own introspective mm. experiences and not just at the science that has to do with, um, with uh, weird humans um, and not just at cross-cultural humans and not just at adult humans um, and not just at humans, um, but at, at other species, looking at other species as well. So I really do hope that philosophy is going to continue doing what it's doing, but expand um, to really recognize that our questions, the kind of data that we can use it to grapple with our questions will come from the things we're learning about other species too. Hmm. Now, I think it's hard to deny that the philosophy of animal minds, which has been rapidly growing, but I wonder if it's being overshadowed by this rapid increase in literature on um, AI minds, mm. right? There's so many jobs now opening up in philosophy of artificial intelligence, uh, philosophers are wondering whether large language models can be conscious. And I wonder if in the wake of this, this might overshadow this uh, increase of animal minds research. Well, it's my hope that the opposite will be true, because these kinds of questions that we're asking about AI minds, I think, can only be answered if we answer um, questions about animal minds first, we already have these examples of minds that are quite unlike human minds, that we have really high confidence in their, their consciousness, as opposed to the LLMs where mm. we have very low confidence in their consciousness. Future um, AI systems might even push, you know, push us, make us feel even more, uh, you know, less certain whether or not they're conscious. But we're going to always be stuck with this question of how can we really tell if they're mm. conscious? And I think that's why we need a theory of consciousness and a theory of consciousness we're only going to get by studying those systems that are part of our, our evolutionary lineage. So we really need to do animal, animal cognition and consciousness research. We really need to do philosophy of animal minds if we're going to do um, philosophy of AI very well. And I've been I've been talking about this with a lot of folks in AI as well, and they understand the value of seeing like mm. different organizations of cognition, how that is going to help them understand how they can design and also then evaluate um, the the kinds of systems that they're developing and that are are emerging from uh, mm. machine learning. Yeah, I agree with you fully. There, it's artificial systems are so different from us far more different than perhaps other animals right so if you don't if if 
yeah, first we we really need to understand other animals and their different forms of cognition. And that can then help us to map out what is perhaps larger space is of other possible minds. How, Because um, often the question that people raise is whether really people aren't interested in whether AIs have minds at all, but rather if they have something like human minds. I think often that's the question people are interested in. But perhaps that's misleading because they might just have very different minds that are richer than ours in some ways, but then much poorer in others, and that they could still be morally relevant in that sense, right? Yeah, absolutely. And this is not unlike the the connection to astrobiology as well, mm. right? This idea of, of when we're looking for intelligence elsewhere in the universe, um, if we look for human-like intelligence, we might be missing all sorts of information. Mm. Um, just like if we're looking for uh, Earth-like life um, and, and biosignatures, we might be missing all sorts of, uh, of uh, possible signals of intelligence or other kinds of um, other kinds of cognitive systems that might be out there. Hmm. So we have to be open-minded, and I, I think that keeping this kind of this curiosity and openness to difference is really important when we're doing research on animals and in and, and astrobiology and in, in AI as well. Um, yeah, I would really like to see every AI lab have an animal behaviorist or animal cognition mm. researcher as a lab member. Every time I've seen these conversations, they have been incredibly valuable and rich uh, in in labs and in these environments. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I want to... If we have enough uh, animal minds research <laughs> with the rapid growth of AI labs everywhere. Hmm. Yeah, but, we. I know that there are a lot of uh, junior scholars who are looking for employment, so they are that's out That's right. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I recently wrote a paper with Heather on um, how we could make progress in understanding introspection by looking at both animals and AIs. And certainly, if you understand introspection and an other animals, we can ask this question of what forms of introspection would be useful for them to have given their different ecological lifestyles, right? Mm -hmm. And then that can feed back into the question of, well, what forms of introspection might be useful for some AI systems based on what task we want them to perform, right? Mm -hmm. And that yep. kind of functionalist understanding can feed back and forth. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think functional thinking is incredibly valuable in answering these sorts of questions. And functional thinking really does also require creativity and thinking about other possible functions that might be, again, very different from the hmm. sorts of functions that uh, that humans have. Uh, yeah. So did you perhaps encounter any difficulties uh, of your students to defend their naturalistic uh, approach to philosophy on the job market? Has philosophy uh, changed there? Yeah, it's. I think it has changed. I think it's really lovely and it, it really has changed. And there's been so much openness and excitement around what my students are doing. Um, a lot of it is also because alongside the looking at other sorts of animal minds is an acknowledgement of the diversity that exists in human minds as well. Mm. Um, and so there is a, you know, of the moment sort of element to that kind of research when you're looking at how minds might differ due to neurodiversity or mm. different sorts of cultural um, differences in, in cognitions and it's so it's it's really quite nice um and my students have been finding a lot of support uh some of them could are, could still find a tenure track job or optimistic this year <laughs> but um yeah i think it's i think it's going really well yeah many of the people that i knew now have jobs myself included so mm -hmm. uh, it seems like a lot of people working on animal minds have been hired recently i don't know myself yes. at Reading, Hedda at Southampton, Ali Boyle at LSE. Well, there's, there's a lot of hiring in this field seeming going on. That's right. Yeah. Which yeah, is a good so how, thing, right? <laughs> it is a really good thing. And and you tell me, how did you find your the interview process? Were people asking you mm. why you qualify as a philosopher? Or is that a question that people don't need to ask anymore? 
Yeah, no, I think uh, there was quite a lot of interest in my research. Though mm-hmm. a couple of my interviews, um, or quite a few actually, were on AI jobs, and I tried to motivate my research in trying to uh, also then helping us to in, to study AI systems. And I didn't really work well against the pure AI researchers in those yeah. interviews. Um, so that 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 did seem like there was more interest in researchers thinking about AI minds compared to animal minds in general. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think there was also something unique about my research approach that just caused a lot of interest um, that Mm -hmm. could have impact beyond academia that is relevant for, uh, yeah, not just for armchair debates about the philosophy of mind, but also for ethics, right, for policy, which animals should we protect, have legislation, right? Um, students now at Reading are very interested in my research. Um, That's great. So it's it's nice to see the interest in questions like, oh, which, what mental states uh, do animals have? Which mental capacities do they have? Um, so it's it's very fun to teach uh, these topics. I think that's great. I'm I'm really happy to hear that. I think we've put to bed the why is this philosophy question. Um, And I do think that we're getting a lot more uptake, not just in philosophy. And by we, I mean people who think that questions about other species are relevant Hmm. to answering traditional questions that have been of interest to humanity scholars. So we, I'm part of a a CIFAR community, um, a CIFAR fellow in the Future Flourishing group. And this Future Flourishing group has um, as its mandate to um, transform our thinking about how to flourish well without anthropocentrism. Mm, uh, yeah. And we were an, an interdisciplinary group of scholars, anthropologists, behavioral biologists, um, historians, um, and so on. And we're really interested in these these questions broadly and we want to make impact broadly too we Mm. want to really help uh transform people's thinking about other species and um and it's been really fun so far talking with with people from really different academic Mm. backgrounds who all recognize the importance of thinking about uh non-human species and and that share the problems with anthropocentric thinking yeah suppose this makes our subfield of philosophy quite a bit unique that a lot of philosophers getting into it they they care about animals right it's not just a neutral pursuit of trying to understand other minds but but also seeing how our society is very anthropocentric right animals Mm -hmm. aren't given anything like equal status um Mm -hmm. or sometimes any status right um so trying to change that i think has influenced a lot of people in the field. What about you? Was that also part of your motivation to get into this uh, area? I just always found animals and my relationships with the animals in my mm. life really interesting. You know, we adopted a stray cat when I was a little kid growing up in California, and I was just so curious developing, you know, relationships with with my yeah. cat Sydney. And I was watching Flipper and Lassie on TV. <laughs> and so there are these representations of humans having relationships with non-human animals. So I really did kind of grow up thinking that you can have social partners with with different species. Uh, it was um, just a way of thinking. And then when I started getting into philosophy, I, I just noticed that there was almost no talk of other other animals. And when I saw Tom Nagel's, what is it like to be a bat? I was so excited. Oh my goodness, a philosopher is talking about other animals. It was the, it was the best. And when I read Dennett and his work with the mm. vervet monkey alarm calls and that he went to Kenya to, um, to do work in the field, <laughs> I was so excited. Yeah. I was like, yes, this is the kind of philosophy I want to do. It really combined these mm. interests I had in um in social relationships with non-human animals with these these deep questions that were really driving me in philosophy yeah i think i have a very similar background there where 
I, coming from a philosophy and economics degree, it looked like I was going to do philosophy and economics, but then I became much more interested in biology and these game theoretic issues. But it, it didn't seem as interesting to me just sitting in a, say, computer lab and working on a model. Not that that's an unimportant work, but when I read about the work of someone like Don Ross, um, who's this philosopher, a cognitive scientist, economist, who has uh, chucked melon, watermelons to elephants in order to <laughs> test some economic theories that just seemed mm -hmm. like such an exciting uh, kind of work that one could do. Um, yeah, almost It's almost questionable why not more um, philosophers want to do this research because... It just seems so exciting. Hmm. Yeah, I imagine for a lot of people, they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to get get involved. Um, they're curious, but um, but don't know what the paths are. Yeah. And this is why why Pamba's there too, is that we we can help hmm. serve as an ambassador for young people who are majoring in philosophy and hmm. thinking, you know, listening to this podcast or hearing about yeah. reading some philosophers. We're working with animals and thinking, I want to do something like that. Uh, we can help them. We can help guide them. There are a number yeah. of places where students can go to get PhDs and get trained by people who are doing this research mm, as well. That's great. I'll um, put I'll put a link uh, in the show notes. <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah, interdisciplinarity is hard, but I guess this is what organizations like Pamba can really help us to provide uh, students or grad students uh, interest in pursuing this interdisciplinary research with these contacts uh, flaps that might be interested in this mm. yeah, absolutely absolutely it's just um a way of, of rolling out the red carpet for the people who are out there and want to do the work <laughs> <laughs> all right well um thanks so much for coming do you have any closing words for us um, I'm just really um, glad you're doing this podcast, Walter. It was really fun talking to you. And um, it's nice to have the opportunity to step back from the the details of the papers I'm working on mm. and, and kind of talk about the larger stories and um, and and the history of, of this this field of research. It's, it's, it's right. fun. And, and I hope uh, hope people find it interesting. <laughs> yeah, definitely one of the goals of this podcast is to be accessible to the general public and those outside of philosophy or to communicate scientific information, perhaps to philosophers who aren't as familiar with that kind of work or that they could work on that themselves. So it's great that someone like you is really interested in also being engaged in um, public outreach. Mm -hmm. Of course, you write a lot of uh, articles for magazines like Aeon, for instance, trying to communicate scientific philosophical results. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for having you today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks to you. Yeah, thanks uh, also to the audience for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'll have a link to Kristen Andrews' work that you can check out. And yeah, I hope you have a good week. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.